Hello everyone, this is Katherine Hinkleman. Today I'm going to present our work on our conference paper. In addition, we also extended this work into a journal article that is available as a preprint. These results I will also include in the presentation today. For the agenda, first I will introduce the background and motivation, followed by the real-world case study, including both the system description and Medallica models. Next, I will present the energy measures that we evaluated, and then the results, including the validation, the baseline models, and the energy measures. Lastly, I'll leave you with inclusion and some key takeaways. First, the introduction. For those who are less familiar with building HVAC systems and district cooling, typically individual cooling equipment is provided at each building. As opposed to this, district cooling aggregates the cooling generation equipment for the district scale and then distributes chilled water to each building through a distribution piping network. This aggregation has a variety of benefits, one being economies of scale, both economically and environmentally. It also allows higher efficiency systems and equipment to be used. And in the context of energy and climate targets, these benefits are very important because space cooling is growing faster than any other building end use. And this is making district cooling a very favorable option for many communities across the globe. In order to realize the benefits of district cooling, computational modeling and simulation is a very effective approach. However, there are some important gaps. First, district cooling modeling and simulation is generally limited. And to the best of our knowledge, none have modeled complete district cooling systems, including both detailed plants and the distribution network, featuring hydraulics and water side economizers. The water side economizers are important free cooling heat exchangers for district cooling. To address these gaps, we have three main objectives. First is to demonstrate how Medellica and the Buildings Library can be adopted for district cooling energy analysis, including hydraulics. Second is to identify energy efficiency strategies for a real-world case study. And third, we want to go beyond energy and evaluate carbon and operational cost savings due to the energy retrofits as well. Next, I will present the case study. For the real-world case study, we modeled the Williams Village campus at the University of Colorado Boulder. This campus has six buildings that are connected to a centralized plant, and each of these buildings have a variety of functions. Primarily, they are dormitory spaces, and then there also is cafeteria, a gymnasium, and a variety of classrooms. For some of the details, I've included the schematic here of the central plant. So what this plant has is two water-cooled chillers that are connected in parallel with the water side economizer so that either the economizer can run or the chillers can run, but both cannot run at the same time. In blue here is the chilled water side, and this is the, the cooled water that is distributed to the rest of the district. There are chilled water pumps that are variable speed, and there's also a bypass loop that maintains the minimum flow rate through the chillers. The condenser water side here in green is the back-ended working fluid of the plant that rejects the heat from the chillers and the water side economizer to provide the cooling needs. This condenser water side has two cooling towers and a bypass loop as well, and there are two condenser water pumps that operate at a constant speed. So this district cooling system we implemented in Medellica. Here you can see the top level Medellica diagram. This model we built hierarchically, which allows each of the subsystems and buildings to be tested in isolation, and also various configurations to be tested as well. So at this top level diagram, we have a central plant, we have a distribution network, and a vectorized set of buildings representing each of the six buildings in this, in this system. If we unpack the central plant, you can see on the right here is the schematic of the fluid loops where we have both the condenser water loops and the chilled water loops. And in general, this follows a one-to-one -one relationship with the schematic I showed on the previous page as well. If I again unpack the chillers with the parallel water side economizer, you can see the two chillers and the water side economizer as well. Also in the central plant, there are a variety of control blocks that reflect the real hierarchical control of this plant. And as one example, I've unpacked here, at looking at the cooling mode control, that's the top master level control. And for this plant, it can operate in a variety of different states. Uh, in addition to off, it's either in free cooling mode or mechanical cooling mode. And free cooling is when the economizer is running, and the mechanical cooling is when the chillers are running. And there's also a pre-mechanical cooling mode to protect the chillers. 
So all these models are using some existing models from the Medellica Buildings Library, and we also added new models to the Buildings Library, uh, particularly in the experimental DHC package, in order to allow others to do case studies for district cooling systems. And now these models here that I'm showing right now are for this particular plant, but in the Buildings Library we have released generic plants and district configurations to study a variety of different systems. So with that case study, we studied a variety of different energy efficiency measures, and I'm going to present two of the main categories here next. The two main categories for energy measure approaches we took are a control temperature set point optimization and also a pump set point adjustment. For the set point optimization, we looked particularly at optimizing the condenser water supply temperature set point. This is the highlighted segment in yellow, and it's the condenser water that is supplied to the water side economizer and the chillers. For the pump set point adjustment, we looked at adjusting the condenser water pump quantity and flow rate. And again, this is the highlighted section here. In addition to these individual measure categories, we also look to combine the top measures from each in order to assess the impacts. For the temperature set point optimization, we formulated a set of single objective problems that collectively minimize the plant's annual energy consumption. So for this problem, we look to minimize the total plant energy during the optimization period by adjusting the condenser water supply temperature set point. And this set point is constrained by the free parameter upper and lower limits. In order to calculate the total plant energy, we integrated over the optimization time horizon the power of the chillers, the power of the condenser water pumps, the chilled water pumps, and the cooling towers. For this optimization, we formulated three different set point methods. First, we did a fixed temperature where the condenser water supply temperature set point is simply a constant value. Next, we did a fixed approach temperature where the set point is offset from the wet bulb temperature by a constant approach temperature. Thirdly, we did an adjusted approach temperature where this approach to the relative to the wet bulb is adjusted by some adjustment factor R relative to the plant's part load ratio. Now, what do these set points really mean? For cooling towers, the hot, there's hot water entering the cooling tower and the cold water is leaving the cooling tower at some value lower than the hot water but above the ambient wet bulb temperature. Now for the fixed temperature, this leaving cold water temperature is controlled at the constant set point. Whereas for the fixed approach temperature, the difference offset from the wet bulb temperature is always constant. And lastly, the adjusted approach temperature that offset from the wet bulb is changed depending on the part load ratio. Now all of these implementations you do see in practice, um, the fixed temperature is, is, is very common and simple. However, there's many benefits to the approach temperature methods that often provide additional cooling energy efficiency. In addition, we also looked at the pump set point adjustments because pumping energy is often the main contributor to the overall energy consumption for large district cooling systems. This means that it's not only important to include pumps in the consideration for energy analysis, but also to correctly represent the performance curves for the pumps based off the real world equipment. As an example here, I've included the condenser water pump curves from the manufacturer data for this district cooling plant, in addition to both the free cooling operating point and the mechanical cooling operating point. Now, when adjusting these operating points, there are some important considerations. As an upper limit, there's a maximum motor power that we cannot exceed. There's also several lower limits. One is a minimum continuous stable flow for the pump. Another is the flow required by the cooling towers to keep the surface wetted and the speed to meet the cooling power static lift. Lastly, there's also a minimum chiller condenser flow rate. Next, I will share the results from these case studies. For verification and validation, we looked across both thermofluid and electrical systems and also systems and equipment levels. For the thermofluid system at the system level, we evaluated both the coefficient of variation of the root mean square error and the normalized mean biased error to make sure all the points measured were within industry standard targets. For the equipment level, we looked at a variety of equipment at different instances within the simulation. And for the chiller, as an example here, you can see that the simulation and measured data matched very well. For the electrical system at the systems level, we set upper and lower limits for the measured data and then verified that the simulation always was within those expected limits. Now, the reason why we had to do this was because this system does not have electrical sun metering and the plant also 
provides not only cooling, but other functions as well, including the district heating plant. So for the equipment level, what we did is we looked at each of the equipment and verified that the power is always operating within the expected ranges of those equipment. Here are the results for the baseline district cooling system. In the summer, the plant consumed the most energy. However, there was still some cooling needs in these colder months as well. And also in the summer, the most of the energy was consumed by the chillers, while in the other seasons, the condenser water pumps were the dominating factor. And on an annual basis, this plant site consumed 567 megawatt hours. We also looked at the detailed thermal fluid performance. And as an example, we have plots here for both the free cooling mode and the mechanical cooling mode. And we looked at a variety of different factors here to verify the system performance and identify where we can make some energy efficiency improvements within this system. And as one example here, you can see that the condenser water mass flow rate and in, in free cooling in particular was fairly high. And relative to the ambient wet bulb temperature, there was some space to maybe increase the delta T on this side, which would improve the efficiency of the cooling power while also reducing the pump energy consumption. For the condenser water temperature set point optimization, we first did a multi-period optimization where it was always the fixed condenser water supply temperature set point with different optimization horizons. And what we found was most of the savings were actually achieved through the annual optimization with less than 1% of additional gains through daily optimization. And for a real implementation perspective, this was the best result because this just means they could have one set point for the entire and use it for the entire year. Beyond that, we also did the annual optimization with the three different set point methods. And with the fixed condenser water supply temperature set point, you can see that the optimized value is actually higher than the baseline. And what this caused was there was then small increases in chiller energy. However, this, there was also a large decrease in cooling tower fan, fan energy, and that's where most of the savings came from. Beyond this one approach, we also did the fixed approach temperature, which further increased the savings from 2.5 to 4.4%, and the adjusted approach temperature maintained those level of savings. And based off these results, we would recommend to the plant to do the fixed approach temperatures at the set point, because the sensors are already in place to do this methodology, and we're not adding any unnecessary complexity without quantified savings. Looking at the condenser water set point adjustments, we ran a variety of cases with different quantities of pumps running at one time and different flow rates. And some of the main takeaways from this is different configurations produced different delta T's on the condenser water side, different efficiencies for the pump, and resulting different electric power consumptions for the pumps as well. And on an annual basis, these bottom two cases produced the best results with around 10% annual savings. And from this, we selected one of the cases for further analysis. Going beyond energy, we also evaluated the energy cost and the carbon dioxide emissions. And we really wanted to include these factors as well because energy alone is more of a means to an end, where uh, both the cost and carbon emissions are the end products and impacts that the community see. So for these case studies, the combination of the fixed approach temperature and the Two condenser water pumps operating at 50 kilograms per second produced the best results. And for this plant, we are able to save 15% of energy, 9% on electricity costs, and 15% on carbon emissions. Lastly, the conclusions. I'm going to conclude today with some main takeaways. First, Medelica is suitable for district cooling modeling and simulation. Second, we have open source released new models in the Medelica Buildings Library that can be used for future case studies. Third, accurately representing the hydraulics and pressure-driven flow are very important for district cooling system energy analysis. For this case study in particular, the energy costs and carbon savings were on the order of 5 to 15 percent, and these are readily available and don't require financial investments by the district cooling system. However, deeper savings are possible, but they do require retrofit measures with financial investments, which can be evaluated in future simulations. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd like to acknowledge some of our funding agencies and collaborators from this project from the U.S. Department of Energy and U.S. National Science Foundation, in addition to BIPSA Project One. And I look forward to your questions and conversations during the Q&A.